Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The good thing about long CVs is that it gives us time to get started if you use technology. Um, I only managed to listen to the two previous speakers, but I congratulate the organizers for setting the program up in the way it was set up because I think it fits nicely into what I thought I should present in the framework of our program here without knowing what the previous speakers would say, but that's the idea of being a professor that you adjust to different conditions and circumstances. So what I do here is on the one hand to present something like an academic business card, being a member of the institution, as Betsy said, I am the academic director in the academic part of the ICD. It's kind of similar to what Andreas Kramer said about the double nature of Ecologic, that on the one hand it is a think tank and on the other hand it's a research institution. So this is not just two tracks, but it is something that also has consequences for our self-perception and the way we are dealing with definitions. So that's why I thought I could start with basics as a member of academia in which we do not only use terms, but we use terms according to clear-cut definitions to clarify what we do. This is what we always tell our students to keep in mind. And so the structure is pretty straightforward. I have nine slides and I hope I meet the time frame to have a little more than the one question that all the previous speakers got. So what is cultural diplomacy? What is Europe? What is the European Union, European integration? And then last but not least, an answer to my question, the task of how do I see the connection between European integration and cultural diplomacy? If you visit our website, and I'm sure you did, because that's usually how we get in touch with our participants in our program. Then you find a lot about definitions and what cultural diplomacy is referring to. But I think in essence of all the things we do, not as the academic branch of cultural diplomacy, but also as the think tank and the provider of being a platform to meet with people and to network, is a pretty straightforward concept of there's globalization. Globalization changes the world we live in. We are citizens in a more and more globalizing world. So we should get ready for the challenges. And by getting ready for the challenges, it would make perfect sense to learn something like the literacy of intercultural communication and mutual understanding. And this is about education and getting to know each other either in a very practical dimension, what Andreas Kramer pointed out as learning in the case studies about the different challenges in a highly technical field like environmental protection, or what we heard before by the ambassador of Portugal, there is a financial crisis, what is the problem, can we fix it, let's change a few things like A, B, C, D, E, and then the crisis is less likely to happen again. And if we are optimists, then we believe that now this system is working better. But the one question that was accepted was about, shall we leave the economy to economists? And the answer was implicitly no, because this is a bad idea, because they do what Andreas pointed out to be something like members of an epistemic community, because they only have the same education, they only understand each other, but they cannot think beyond the box. And the problem is that all the models that they apply only work inside of the epistemic community. And if you use a zebra in Berlin to cross the street, then you think you know what a zebra is. And if you do the same in Naples, then you probably die because the model as such is not the same depending on how we apply the model in different cultural contexts. So that's why we are so committed to spread the word about it's important to learn these things and everyone immediately embraces it and that's why the ICD is so popular and people come from different parts of the world to study the things that we offer, but there's also a risk and the risk is all these things to transform us into cosmopolitans comes with redistributional effects. 
So if you change a cultural system by exposing it to something else, or if you work as an exporter of norms and values, then this is not neutral. So the question is not only do we need more platforms and marketplaces for an intercultural exchange and to learn from each other, but also to create an awareness of the intended and unintended consequences of this. And on this very abstract level, I want to get slowly lower in abstract thinking and apply it on my European example. So when we look at a definition on the ICD website, then on the one hand, it shows the scope of cultural diplomacy and how each and every one of you felt connected with what the ICD suggests. There's culture, sounds sexy, there's diplomacy, sounds also highly attractive, and the combination of the two makes you feel like, oh, this is more important than leaving things to the economists if it's only the rhetoric of what people use inside of an epistemic community. The problem for us in academia is that definitions of that kind that you find in the lower part of this slide are not really a definition because it pretty much covers everything. And so the good thing about a think tank or about a marketplace is that everyone can find something that he or she finds attractive to think or to look through the lens of cultural diplomacy to describe something or to understand something or to learn a technique of mutual understanding like the three examples that Andreas pointed out. But all of these things don't work as a definition that help us to clarify what is cultural diplomacy and what is not. Because if it covers everything, then it doesn't work as a definition. And that is the other problem that we are dealing with in the two branches of being a think tank that connects with everything, culture as sports or culture like the normative culture of running a monetary union. It's a certain specific regulatory culture, how we do things with a centralized monetary policy and a decentralized fiscal policy. And obviously it's not working, so we adjust a few things. This is highly cultural, even if it's not addressing artists or lifestyles or all the things, but the way we organize a monetary union in Europe has far-reaching cultural repercussions, even if people are not aware of it. Like the whole austerity discourse clearly shows how directly it affects people's lives. So this is something else we have to keep in mind, which leads me to my next thing, which is, and what does that mean for Europe and European integration? So first of all, Europe is not the European Union, even if we often talk about the United States as America and the European Union as Europe, there is certainly more, but it's also something like a cultural space in which we have been socially formatted by religion, by history, by collective narratives and experiences, which defines this as a cultural space without meeting my clear-cut definition criterion on what exactly is the definition. Because then on the edges, like Turkey, the question is, is this sufficiently European to become a member of a club that uses the word Europe in its self-definition as a political space? So in all these efforts to define the cultural space objectively, we fail because there is nothing like a given definition of Europe because it fully depends again on the members of the epistemic communities, whether we talk to people from the geography department and they say, well, this is what we do with drawing maps and stuff, or whether we talk to economists who say, well, if you don't qualify in terms of convergence criteria, you are out, or if we talk to geologists and they say there's a European plate and an American plate, which is different from how we draw political borders or shall we use water or political borders. So all the different definitions are not identical, but there is a lot of overlap. And even if we have a checklist of 12 different criteria, we don't really know if nine is sufficient or maybe 10. So at the end of the day, it's subjective slash political, how to define who belongs to a country that could qualify to join a political slash cultural system that is committed to certain norms and values and principles and techniques of problem solving. That is my subject in talking about European integration as a form of cultural diplomacy, because this is different from how 
border management in Pakistan is managed or how privacy issues in the United States differ from the European Union or whatever practical example you pick. So what we have here is geography, a cultural space. Culture also goes hand in hand with historical experience. Reality is not what we measure, but reality is how we talk about things. So the socially constructed reality of this is how we think is Europe in comparison to other parts. And we, in this part of the world, believe that the values that we share are universal. This is probably different from the one or the other part of the world who has a slightly different understanding about what is the essence of what we stand for. So if you believe these things are universal, it's not enough to just claim that we have forms of problem solving or how we do our water management or how we run our monetary union, but it is also a moral obligation to not just shy away and to ignore what happens in other parts of the world if there are fundamental violations of principles that we consider to be universal. On the other hand, this European continent has a pretty bad history in terms of being a colonial power and exporting values in the name of cultural imperialism. So this is a very thin line between what is morally needed and what is something in which we tell others how to lead their lives and to adjust their cultures to what we think is the way one should live in the 21st century in the name of we are all cosmopolitans in an ever-shrinking world under the headline of globalization. So when we then look at the consequences for those who are part of this historical experience, we see that the fact that we believe in a cultural diversity in Europe that we are proud to be German. Andreas highlighted a different order. I'm perfectly fine with a German flag and a European flag and a United Nations flag. I could even add a Bavarian one because I grew up in Bavaria and that's an integral part of my personal identity. But the main concept of this is what you find not on the map, uh, not on the list here, is unity in diversity. That the motto of this concept is we try to unite the continent or however you define the space in the name of respect for cultural diversity. And this is the main challenge. So how can we become one without ignoring the fact that we want to be different and how do we balance unity and diversity in some sort of a cultural response by building an institutional framework that guarantees that no one is dominated by a centralist system and at the same time that too much decentralization doesn't deliver what the club promises to deliver as a public good that an individual subsystem could not deliver or in which it would be prohibitively expensive to try so. So on the one hand, we form a political system, but we don't replace the nation state. This is a commitment to identity and cultural respect for the subsystems, no matter how little you are as a cultural member of the club, like a member state of a few hundred thousand people. Secondly, we use economic means to integrate further with all the intended or unintended consequences that your question was referring to. Like, if we centralize monetary policy, we have to think about the consequences in fiscal policy. If fiscal policy would also centralize, that requires an additional legitimacy. If we legitimize a centralized fiscal policy, remember how the whole democratic thing started with no taxation without representation, we have to strengthen our institutions. If we strengthen our institutions, it has far-reaching consequences for the nation state and for the citizens and their feeling of belonging. So this is not neutral. We change one thing in a subsystem and it has intended or unintended spillover effects in related ones and then we suddenly wake up in a Europe that no one intended to build but it's there because in this piecemeal incremental developments, this is just what we got as a response to a crisis or whatever urgent challenge. So what we constructed is something like a federal system. I don't have the time to go into detail, but I'm happy to explain the F word if there are questions about why I call this federal, but since I come from Germany and not the UK, 
I can use the F word in a different way than the connotation to further centralization. And what Andreas was also referring to in terms of good governance, this is based on the rule of law. And this is also a very specific European dimension that even if we fight for our national interests and our cultural differences and whatnot, at the end of the day, if a decision is taken and if it's the law, then we comply. And we means not only the member states, but everyone involved in our judicial systems and the watchdogs of how to run the system jealously insist on if we violate this core principle, everything will be ruined because it's based on the idea of one integrated legal space. So by doing this, we are not running just another international organization, but we format the life of everyone involved. So we, as Europeans, become ambassadors of this concept of European integration as cultural diplomacy because we have rights and we can take them to court in case somebody violates them. And we also have a say because we can move freely in this integrated space. We could even become mayors or members of parliament in other countries because we have something like double citizenship. And that makes us containers of this new European culture that helps to adjust two challenges of globalization in a subsystem called the European Union. So that makes it a little clearer what I meant by European integration in terms of what it's doing in cultural diplomacy. So in the happy definition of what I meant, the European Union is not enforcing a way of running the system by the power of its military force or by um, financial pressure or sanctions or whatnot, the most powerful instrument is leading by example. So if it's working and it sends a signal to a sovereign state that you can be perfectly integrated into something without losing your identity and you punch above your weight if you're little, poor, on the border, on the periphery, then this is a powerful concept of problem solving and balancing unity in diversity without being forced to join. Of course, we can discuss what the real alternatives are for Turkey or the Ukraine to sit on the fence to decide, would it be better to turn our face in another direction, but away from this gentle giant and the magnetism of an existing single market. But at least there is nothing like the monster European Union can't wait to swallow the next neighbor and then it grows like cancer. It's more the opposite that everyone who is already in would rather like to get a break to digest what we have to digest in terms of mutual understanding in practice and the mutual socialization, not only making our neighbors more like us and if everything feels, smells and tastes like us, then mission is accomplished and we can move on with further deepening or widening or whatever comes. The other powerful instrument when we speak of European integration as cultural diplomacy comes with conditionality. So if a country is attracted by the way we do things here as one cultural space, it applies for membership, meaning that it's not accepted the way it applies, but it goes through a pretty dramatic transformation politically, economically, socially, culturally to become a country that meets the criteria that we once were formulated in Copenhagen in 93, that you have to fulfill, otherwise you will not be taken. And this is something that can be discussed in a more practical way with candidate countries. Turkey is a wonderful example to elaborate a bit on this. Unfortunately, we have not the time, only five minutes left. So I just leave it here in case you want to know something. We can use our one or two questions to go further into detail. But the conditionality thing, like only if you fulfill the requirements that the club defines allows you to join, is a very powerful instrument to export values and norms and principles that a country that wants to participate can choose. If they don't fulfill them, then they stay candidate forever. And there is nothing like an inbuilt automatism to join at the very end. So 
altogether, this ever-growing union in terms of widening and deepening provides soft, hard, and the combination of the two hard power, which leaves a few remaining problems. First of all, if the expectations are high-flying, you will always create disappointment because then the ones who carefully look what the European Union is and does will be disappointed because they think they could do more and then they don't bring much to the table. Not in terms of military force, not in terms of speaking with one voice, not making an efficient use of their limited resources, not to convince EU citizens that in their best interest to identify with a construction site, because who loves construction sites? On the one hand, it's flexible enough to respond to a changing global order. On the other hand, this permanent reinvention with new names and different principles and decision-making modes doesn't make it interesting for people to study this because it's constantly changing. So this is radically different from an anti-European or Western or open society approach in which the search for truth in the name of a specific religion is pretty much the opposite because that tries to provide something which is not discourse-based, but it is based on we know better, this is the essential truth, and we fight in the name of truth against this anything-goes postmodern way of problem solving in an open discourse. And this is currently what we can experience in a number of clashes that have something to do with Huntington, but in a different way. And again, I don't have the time to elaborate on what I mean by this. So another problem is if it doesn't function like a state because it misses a lot of competences, it's not effective. If it changes things because it is kind of a catalyst to modernize quicker and to respond to challenges of globalization. It comes with redistributional effects, and those who lose something respond in a nationalist or reactionist or conservative way and respond defensive. And this is natural because if you have winners and losers, the losers don't see why they should embrace changes that are not in their interests. And this is something that we constantly have to deal with, and this is certainly one of the remaining problems where there is not one technical answer to it. As a conclusion, Europe is a cultural space, no matter if we talk about the monetary union, the environmental, or whatever, it has a lot to do with the culture of how do we do things. It's not about cultural imperialism in the sense of we make the world more European and then mission is accomplished and then we can close down the United Nations because the European Union knew it anyway. And it is convincing as a model if it delivers what it promises. And it's not trivial what it promises. It was about peace, prosperity, and stability. And in times of the crisis, systems like that are much more vulnerable and much harder to keep stable if there is no implicit loyalty of citizens of a nation state who, whatever it takes, will stay loyal because this is how they identify themselves as national citizens, while in the case of the European Union, it's more like a service provider. And the ser if the service isn't satisfying, you quit your membership and say, well, pfft, then I return to my national system, or if I'm surrounded by water, I rather run my own show and don't think that Brussels could provide me something. So even if the European Union is not trying to intend a change in the other parts of the world, although it's morally obliged given the assumption of universal values, it acts as a cultural actor by the sheer existence. And this is something that leaves a lot of room for discussion in the various case studies that we addressed. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to do more, but I try to be disciplined as my students used to be disciplined in my class. And thank you very much for your attention. Hi, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. My name is Juliana, I live here in Berlin, and my question would be in, in which sense could like learning from what the European Union did um, could be applied to concepts like the um, Arabic Union, the African Union, um, etc., and what c could they learn from, from the European Union? 
Well, generally speaking, we can always learn from a comparison, but we should always avoid the um, oversimplification of looking at European integration as a recipe, and then we just identify the crucial variables for the functioning of European integration, adopt it to another system, do A, B, C, D, E, and then we have a fully functioning Arab Union, African Union, or whatsoever. So you learn a lot about what is working, what are the costs, what are the benefits, what are the conflicting goals. If you do the things you do, then you have to deal with unity and diversity. If you have a not so gentle giant, like one country is much larger than the others, or there are fundamental differences, then you have to take this into consideration. But altogether, I think you learn a lot about costs and potential benefits. And then you can decide, similar to what think tanks would do, to provide you the variety of options and the scope to um, let you choose. Like this notion from the ambassador that at this point in the crisis, European member states had no choice is simply not true because there are always choices. Sometimes they are prohibitively expensive, but what we do in academia is to show the range of options and then everyone in the driver's seat or the interested public can decide this is what I like better. And so by analyzing the European Union in its composition, in its ideas, its interests, in institutions and how it balances discourses and at what point are we conservative to defend elements of our culture and at what point are we opening systems and norms and regulations for competition as a concept of globalization and then they change and then we reinvent our European culture in a way which is different from what our parents and grandparents experienced. We try to balance something in a unique European way, which is different from the Arab, the African, or the Asian, Latin America, whatever regional case you take. But I think a general message is you can get richer, you can live in a more peaceful way if you get your act together and if you find your specific answer to all the trade-offs that exist once you integrate in a regional manner. But not like this is the EU blueprint, take it somewhere else, and then the world will be a better place. Thank you very much for your talk. So I'm going to ask you about immigration. I know it's controversial, and I'm just learning about it. But could you talk about how countries should keep a balance between certainly admitting, and I myself am an immigrant, uh, from Peru to Canada, but admitting, you know, happily immigrants, uh, whether for refugee reasons or, or working condition issues, uh, reasons, and at the same time, making sure they maintain their own culture. Because I would think, maybe, if the population of immigrants is too big coming to a country, even though it's good to have maybe, you know, some multiculturalism and allow people to exert their, their culture, you may run the risk of losing your own culture, or it may change. So I don't know if uh, you can talk about that. Well, same answer as in my talk. First of all, we as the members of the club define the framework, which is a legal answer to your question. And then we as the citizens choose what we make out of the opportunities that the club provides. So when I grew up in a small town, there wasn't much of multiculturalism. I decided to live in Berlin, and I did what many people do these days in Berlin, to surf on the wave of creativity of others. And that's not necessarily Berliners, like natural born Berliners. What makes the city cool is that all the creative people who search for a certain way of life and creativity come to Berlin and make Berlin what it is today. So if this is what you're looking for, you are in the right city. But if you think that this is not your cup of tea, then you rather go somewhere else and live a different life. And the challenge for the European Union or any other form of immigration is to provide sufficient spaces for different ways of leading a life as an assimilated, integrated, parallel society whatsoever person in 
a concept of pluralism that offers a freedom in the definition not of a freedom of choice, as I pointed out in the first part of my answer, but as a freedom which is the freedom of the other. And not in the sense of this is us, and if you deviate from the norm, we make you more like us, and if you don't, then we kick you out. But this is something that comes from a chosen Berliner. I have a godson in Latvia, and Latvia is drastically shrinking from two point something million to two, and they are also aging because the young population makes use of the opportunities of the single market and lives in other places where you can make more money or live your dream or whatever. So this country or this society is at risk losing its identity if people forget how to speak the language of the titular nation or to stick to what they consider to be Latvian. And if you tell them that they should embrace the concept of this happy Berliner cosmopolitan lifestyle, then it will take one or two generations and then it was just another episode in the history of this part of Europe where something like a Latvian culture simply couldn't exist. So by learning from size matters, when we speak of culture, some technical solutions like don't leave immigration policy to immigration experts would lead to something like a clearing system. We centralize immigration policy, we define quota, and then we have a clearing system that every part of Europe should get a certain number of immigrants, and then we place them all over, and then they should not be a cultural challenge or whatever, or it's burden sharing. This would work in large countries, but it probably doesn't work in the same way in small countries, because then you have other forms of clashes, and these clashes need to be avoided, because otherwise you mobilize anti-European sentiments. If people don't look at the big picture, but only at what does it have to do with me, and why should I live next to this other person that does its laundry on a Sunday morning when I go to church like all these things. So there's no simple answer. The European answer is we have a legal space. We discuss the pros and cons and the different interests involved in an institutional procedure. The result is a compromise. The compromise is bad as all the compromises in comparison with the real thing, but it's better than if one country tells the others that this is how we should do things, because that would be an internal form of cultural imperialism. Not very satisfying, but that's how we do things. On this not so happy note, thank you very much and enjoy your lunch break or is there nothing like this? Ah, later. Oh, later. Who needs lunch if we can have food for thought? Enjoy your conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.